Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is a webinar called Smoothing the Path to Compliance with Lighting Global Quality Standards. Hopefully you can see the slides. If you can't, or if you're having any other difficulties, um, please send us a message through the Zoom web chat. Um, and if this wasn't the webinar you were planning to be on, then you can hang up now. <laughs> um, could you go to the next slide, Lily? Sure. Uh -oh. All right. So we actually have uh, four presenters today. Um, Kim, while she's an uh, integral part of running, of managing this process, uh, can't be with us because it's very early in the morning. Um, in California, but we um, we have today here uh, myself, Ari Reeves. I manage the Lighting Global Quality Assurance Program, uh, along with the te our technical lead, Arnie Jacobson. Um, Lauren Boucher is here with us as well from CLASP. She is on our communications team. Um, Ana Luisa or Luli Sosa from CLASP is also here as a presenter, and Riley McDonald from CLASP. Uh, Luli, Riley, and Kim together manage the what we call the pipeline, which is the process of bring of um, quality verifying products and um, maintaining those products over the course of their um, verification lifetime. Uh, before we go on to the next slide, I wanted to just give you guys a very brief thumbnail sketch of the process that products take. Um, to get quality verified. Um, that'll provide a little bit of context for the subject at hand today. Um, so the um, companies come to the uh, to our team, the quality assurance team, uh, when they have a product that they want to have us verify. Um, when there are lots of reasons why companies come to us to get their products verified, um, to the quality standards, to the Lighting Global Quality Standards. If you want to learn more about the program, um, why companies bring their products to us and so on, I encourage you to visit the Lighting Global website, which is lightingglobal.org. I won't go into any great detail uh, about the website at this, about the program at this point, because uh, I want to make sure there's plenty of time uh, to discuss compliance with the consumer facing information requirements. Um, but I did want to say that the, the process starts with the company coming to us and saying they have a product they want to get verified. They provide some basic information about that product to our team. The team then um, develops a test plan for that product and we sign a agreement with the company uh, regarding testing and verification. The company then um, has to select and contract with a test lab. And um, then we exchange information about where the product can be sampled. We go out and sample the product. When we sample the product, we're taking products from uh, the company's warehouse. And that, that is, uh, we're taking samples of the product in their packaging as they will be sold, including user manual and warranty card or whatever else is, is part of that, that package that's going to be sold to the end consumer. Um, that product is then shipped to a test lab. The product is tested. Um, the test results are sent back to, our, to the QA team. We review the results. We determine whether the product meets the standards or not. Communicate the results back to the company. And if the product meets the standards, the product goes up on the website. Um, in the course of reviewing test results from hundreds of products over the last several years, uh, we of course have found a number of products that uh, have passed this, have met the standards, and many that have failed. Many times the failures can be rectified, they can be corrected. Um, and once the company has corrected the failure, um, the, the product can then be um, listed and is uh, considered to be fully, uh, you know, fully in, in compliance with the quality standards. On the next slide, I want to show you the, um, 
reasons for failure. And really, that's, that's why we're here today. Uh, we showed a slide similar to this one back in May of 2018 at Gogla's annual member conference in Amsterdam. And one of the things that struck us about this, um, about these results, is a lot of them have to do not with the technical capabilities of the product itself, but with the consumer facing information. And if you look at this chart, you can see that um, truth in advertising, performance reporting, and other consumer information together uh, actually constitute two thirds of the total failures. Um, and so I have to note here that this is not the number of products that have failed, but rather the, the test failures. In, the, in other words, some individual products um, have multiple modes of failure or present with multiple, um, multiple failures or fail multiple tests. Um, and therefore the total here is more than the number of products that, that uh, receive failures or conditional passes in some cases. Um, but the, the point is that um, these, this consu these consumer information requirements, um, many times companies uh, find it difficult to meet all those requirements when the product is sampled and goes to the test lab and is evaluated. And we thought, well, what can we do about this? And one thing that occurred to us was that um, it might be that the people within companies such as yours who are uh, responsible for designing uh, the consumer facing information, everything from the package itself to the user manual, the warranty card and other materials uh, may just not be that familiar with the requirements of the quality standards. And those, um, so we put together a document um, to help people um, become more familiar and understand um, all of the requirements uh, related to the consumer information. Um, and that's why we're here today um, for this for this webinar. The, so the, the goals today uh, for the participants are one, to become more familiar with these requirements, as I just said. Um, we'd like you to hear tips about how to ensure the compliance of your products. Um, you'll hear about some common mistakes that we see and um, ways in which people are uh, failing to meet those requirements with their products. And lastly, we'll, we'll explain where you can get help on, these, on this topic in the future. Next slide. Uh, Lauren, do you wanna pick it up here? Or no, maybe this is Luli's. Oh, well, um, this is just the agenda of what we're going to cover. Um, we are describe to you briefly what are the main consequences of failing to meet some of the requirements for truth in advertising, performance reporting, uh, warranty, and other consumer information. Uh, we are going to give you a brief introduction to the compliance guide document. Um, then we're going to do a, an overview of the four aspects of consumer patient information. Um, and in that overview, we're just gonna give you a, like examples of the most common type of issues we see companies having uh, trouble with. And then we're going to open it up for questions and answers. And uh, on the last aspect of this agenda, we're going to request, uh, kindly request you to submit us feedback on this compliance guide, um, because uh, we know that we want this to be a useful tool. And if there are ways that we can improve it, uh, we welcome them. So the consequences of failure, um, when products really do not fully meet the quality standards um, due, due to what we call easy, easily addressable issues um, that do not require retesting is when we give companies, uh, we inform them that the product got a conditional pass. And for cases like this in particular, we call this a conditional pass pending correction which means that the manufacturers have to correct the issue um, to either access or maintain um, the program support for the relevant product or products. Um, 
And receiving a conditional pass really leads to increased program cost um, because and extra coordination time because you we require manufacturers to do, uh, depending on the issues identified, we require manufacturers to basically change uh, a product's packaging, the user manual. Um, we also need to verify that these changes have been made uh, in order to maintain program support. And then if we do identify that a product committed the same mistake um, later, for example, after a renewal test, we do require manufacturers uh, to increase, um, to take responsibility of the cost of a warehouse inspection. And then it could also be followed up with some check testing in the future. So, but more details about our processes on conditional pass are really described in the program's conditional pass policy. But we really wanted to make you all aware about um, the negative the negative side of receiving a conditional pass because of the extra time, uh, the cost, and um, we just want you guys to avoid to go through this process. Great, thank you, Lily. Um, so I'm going to introduce the compliance guide. Um, the Lighting Global Quality Assurance team created this document in late 2018. Uh, as a tool for marketing and other um, professionals uh, to reference early in the quality verification process. Uh, so it was designed to be simple, easy to use, and informative. Um, the document is quite short, uh, and all of the sections are aligned to the consumer facing information requirements of the Lighting Global Quality Standards. This is Lauren that you're hearing from, this, by the way. This is Lauren, yes. Um, and on the next slide, uh, here's a slide that just shows where you can reference uh, this compliance guide. So on the Lighting Global website, um, if you look at the top bar, you'll see a resources tab. Um, you can then select uh, the resource type. So we filed this document under two categories, uh, quality standards and policies and technical notes. So if you select that checkbox, um, you'll see the uh, image for the quality standards compliance guide um, pop up on your screen. Next slide. And then looking at the document, like I mentioned, we've divided uh, it into four sections that align with all of the consumer facing information requirements of the standards. Uh, Riley is going to um, present uh, some of the do's and don'ts. Um, I also did want to mention before we move into the more uh, technical aspects of this webinar, if you have any questions, uh, you can submit them um, and we will answer them at the end of this webinar. Next slide. Oh, sorry, you can go to the previous slide, Lily. Thanks, Lauren. And before we go into the four main components for consumer facing information, I just wanted to give a brief outline that will provide um, the basic, what it means for each consumer facing information piece, what resources you can access to better understand each requirement, and then the do's and don'ts and common mistakes for each item. And I also just wanted to say that we highly encourage uh, manufacturers to submit their consumer facing information materials before they submit a product for sampling. We're happy to review them at any time, and this is the easiest way to avoid a conditional pass. Um, and the, require, the do's and don'ts that we're about to include aren't inclusive of all the requirements, but just to give an idea of the most common mistakes. Next slide. So truth in advertising is the first consumer facing information piece. And this is basically saying that any consumer facing claims about a product's performance need to be accurate. And that includes whether it's on the packaging, user manual, or anywhere else like online advertising. Um, and you can refer to the quality standards for both SHS kits and Pico PV products for more information on these requirements. So the basic do's, are, do's and don'ts, we want to make sure that you're advertising the numerical values within 15% of the tested values. 
Um, so this can be 15% more or 15% less of what was tested. Um, a common mistake we see is that the solar runtime is advertised as um, basically we want to make sure that you're including the brightness setting and the runtime type, either full battery or solar for runtime advertisements. So if you don't include these settings, Lighting Global is going to assume that the runtime advertisement is for the solar runtime on the brightest setting. Um, so if this information isn't matching up, then um, there's going to be uh, an issue with that. Also, please make sure you check the standards to make sure that any claims about water, water or physical protection match the tested IP level. So for example, if a product is advertising as being waterproof, it means that it means, needs to meet the IPX7. And this is also another common mistake that we see. Um, so you can refer to the standards and also send this information to the Lightning Global team to check beforehand. Please also make sure not to include any conflicting information on the packaging or user manual or other sales collateral. So sometimes we'll see that the user manual and um, packaging have the correct um, numerical information, but the website will have conflicting information. So just make sure that everything is lining up um, across all advertising platforms. And then another common mistake we see is that the um, battery's time to full charge advertisement doesn't include efficiency losses. So this advertisement should account for efficiency losses um, for the solar or battery um, charging. Next slide. The next piece is performance reporting requirements. So this basically means that you have to report certain key product features and performance metrics on the product's packaging. And you can see below the three requirements for Pico Solar products and the one requirement for solar home system kits. And you can read more information about this on the performance reporting requirements policy. Next slide. So as I um, outlined in the previous slide, please make sure to include um, the three requirements for Pico PV products and solar home system kits. Do make sure to advertise the solar run time for Pico solar products to include all light points on their highest setting. So this is another common mistake we see. Um, it needs to include even auxiliary um, light points like a torch. So please make sure that the solar runtime includes all light points on. And this might mean having a solar runtime advertisement, one for the main product, and then two for the torch or other auxiliary light. Um, so just make sure that these are accounted for in the solar runtime. And then do be sure to include a company name, model number, and or a uniquely identifiable product name. So this just means that if a Lighting Global representative were gonna, was going to go to the market to try and find a product, they should be easily be able to find the product based on the information that's online um, and be able to differentiate it from other products. And then please don't present the required performance metrics in a different style other than advertisements on the packaging. So this just means um, if you're advertising the solar runtime on the brightest setting, please make sure that this is the same style as the um, full battery runtime on the, on the lowest setting so that it's not misleading for consumers. So um, the next topic uh, would be minimum warranty terms. Um, all products that are quality verified must be backed by a consumer facing warranty. Um, and we have, um, and the minimum duration varies between uh, the, the product types, as you may see on the images of this slide, but more details about uh, each product type are described in the Pico standards for Pico Solar products and then the standards for solar home system kits. Um, additional details are also described in the performance reporting um, requirements policy. So the do's and don'ts for minimum warranty, um, but we see that it's common uh, to, for manufacturers to maybe um, forget to include a consumer facing warranty um, uh, at the time of um, 
at the time of purchase for the customer or even before testing begins. Um, consumer facing means that it needs to be easily accessible in writing uh, to the customer, either on the packaging user agreement. Um, we also want you guys to understand that uh, we need you to provide the adequate minimum warranty period because uh, as I explained before, it varies between product types um, and it needs to begin on the date of purchase by the end of, uh, by the end user. Sometimes uh, we see that uh, a common mistake is to set fixed dates and, um, and companies get a conditional pass for this. Um, the other thing is that you have to clearly explain to the customer how the warranty can be accessed, uh, which could be on the return of point of purchase, the distributor um, through the service center, and um, and how the uh, and how customers can contact the com um, the company for to get their warranty uh, services provided. Um, as I said before, please do not uh, set fixed dates on the warranty period. For example, we see a fixed date would be if you say uh, the warranty is valid between this date and that date. Um, and then also another common mistake is that we've seen some in some cases that the warranty card provides contradictory information. For example, uh, when you say that the product is warranty is valid for two years and then on the descriptions of what's covered in the warranty, we see uh, the reference to a number of months that doesn't match the two years. So uh, that's what we mean by don't provide contradictory information on the warranty link. Um, the other topic uh, addressed in the compliance guide is other consumer facing information requirements. And what we mean by this is this, we have other pieces of information required if for a product's packaging or user manual. And um, these are, details for this are mainly described in the following three do reference documents, which would be the integrated water protection assessment. And there you can have more details about water protection warning label requirements, um, the quality standards for solar home system system kits do provide more details for additional user manual requirements and specifications for components that may require replacement. Um, and then the last document that we're mentioning here is the communication and branding guidelines. Um, here we explain to companies with quality verified products the ways that they can reference uh, the Lighting Global program and its affiliates in all their marketing and communication tools and materials. For water protection warning label requirements, um, common mistakes uh, include a failure to include a warning label about water protection um, when the product doesn't meet the required IP levels. Uh, when this happens, we do require uh, manufacturers to include this label and on this label you should be stating that the product must be either kept dry and provide instructions on how customers should care for the product if it gets uh, water damage exposure. And another uh, recommended um, best practice is uh, that we tell manufacturers to use graphics um, to accompany those instructions. Um, another thing that we see is that companies sometimes uh, um, provide uh, information, uh, state that the product is waterproof or water resistant and that it's, it doesn't really match the IP level to what the product was tested. So please don't say that, you're, that the product is waterproof or water resistant with, without really understanding the in the ingress protection level requirement. Um, for example, uh, if you say that the product is waterproof, then you need to have, um, you need to have the, the test report, the test results that support that the product meets the IP times seven uh, category. Then um, for the additional requirements for solar home system kits, we're just going to highlight a few 
because there are more than the ones that you see described here and please reference the solar home systems quality standards for more details. Um, for example, for uh, we sometimes see that um, in the user manual, um, instructions on, on uh, for, in, for installation and use and troubleshooting the system is not included or um, the appropriate uh, information of in, uh, for placing, for installing, sorry, the PV model it's, uh, is also not included. So please be sure to include these, uh, in, this information aspects in your usual manuals for SHS kits. Um, one other thing that we see sometimes uh, is that manufacturers forget to include a clear statement about the battery replacement on the product packaging. And this is a, uh, an important requirement uh, mainly for solar home system kits. Um, and sometimes we also see that there's insufficient information about the comp about component replacement. Um, and an example is that in directions as to how the consuming consumer can get the components, including the battery, um, it's not uh, is not present, and that's what we we describe as insufficient um, component replacement information. Um, and the last document, as I said before, is the communication and branding, branding guidelines. Um, please, you can reference the, the Lighting Global programs, but only if the following pre-approved phrases, uh, with, with only the following pre-approved phrases. A common mistake is that companies um, address or refer the program and say that their products are certified, approved, supported, recommended. And none of these words are um, uh, approved by Lighting Global. Uh, if we see uh, this type of claims on your products packaging, you will receive um, uh, a notification from us uh, asking you to um, revise those claims uh, to the appropriate uh, to the appropriate language. And another thing that it's common is that companies use uh, the Lighting Global logos and their confusion facing materials and that this is currently not allowed unless you receive prior authorization from the program. So if you need to use the logo for any reasons, please explain to us the purpose and uh, before, uh, before doing so. Otherwise, we will, you will get notified that that needs to be removed um, and we want to avoid just the, the inconveniences of, of, of this. Riley? And now we'd like to open up the questions to any of the companies or others that have any questions about anything that was included in this presentation or anything else related to consumer facing information. I wanna make two quick notes as people are typing their questions. Um, one is that on the last page of the document of the guide, we have a list of references. So all of the documents that people refer to in the session today are listed on that last page. They're also referred to in the appropriate sections of the document as well. Um, and now I forget what the other thing I was going to say was. <laughs> oh, yes, these, we will share these slides with you also after the, at the conclusion of the webinar. And it looks like we have one question coming in in just a minute. But anyone else can feel free to um, send them to us via the chat function. We can also unmute people if you wish to ask your question out loud. Just, just let us know through the chat. I see a hand raised, um, I'll unmute. Hello. Hey, 
hi. Uh, I I have one question. If um, because if uh, I I just wanna know if we fail one of the aspects during the first test, like we may fail the USB um overcharge protection during this testing, and we'd like to apply for just test the specific aspect. How many saplings do we need? I think Kim might be able to answer that question. Yep. Hello, hi, this is Kim. Um, so you're asking if you your product pass everything except for the current protection, yeah, ports protection, and you you want to resample and test just that one aspect. Yes. Um, I think I could give you a general answer. And is it an SHS? Is it a product with a solar module larger than 10 watts or smaller than 10 watts? Uh, smaller than 10 watts. Okay. So in general, for anything under 10 watts, we require a sample size of six. But um, I, so I would say that we would probably want to get seven samples. We usually want to get enough to do the test and then one or two spares, depending on what testing we're doing. But in order to answer that, 100% accurately. I would need to know more about what changes you made in order to fix the problem. So if you changed other things about the product, um, it might require testing other aspects. So, but I'd say in general, we would need seven samples. Oh, so you need seven samples out of 100 or out of? Oh, um, and so the way that we figure out how many total samples or stock we need is um, so for a, a regular QTM test, we take 18 samples out of 500. And so any number less than 18 samples, we use the same proportion. So a quick way that I do it is if you take the number of samples that we need for testing and you multiply it for a Pico product, if you multiply it by 27.777, that will tell you how many total samples we need. So I happen to know that seven samples will require 195 stock. Oh, okay. So you need seven samples out of 195. Uh-huh. And if you want to, um, what, do you mind telling me what product it is? Or if you want to just send me an email after this um, with the product information, I can confirm that all that for you. Oh, uh, okay. So, uh, so during the second sampling for the retesting, do mm -hmm. we still need to offer the package for it, or we just provide the products? Um, just the product is okay. However, if during the first test, any conditional passes, like all the subjects that we were talking about on this uh, needed correction, that's a great time to submit the packaging with the corrections. But if everything was okay on the packaging, um, like no no conditional passes. The only thing that didn't pass was the ports. Um, we don't need to resample the packaging. Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Maybe this would be a good opportunity for someone to say a few words about how we do confirm that um, consumer-facing information has been corrected if it's found to be um, not in compliance with the standards in the initial evaluation. In, kind of in general, she um, the the questioner just asked about um, what how we would handle retesting of a, a technical aspect of the product itself, but in the case that it pertains, the issue pertains to the packaging or something else like that. <clears throat> how do we handle that? Sure, um, this is Kim. I can address that question too. Uh, so, if your product uh, got a conditional pass, that means we don't need to retest anything so we don't require that we resample the product or the packaging but what we do require is that you send us a digital copy of the updates that you made so for an example if you your packaging did not have the solar runtime on the brightest setting and we and you needed to add that you would add that to your packaging send us a digital copy of that of the packaging let us know when you're going to implement that change and then we'll we'll create a an addendum letter. So the cover letter that you first received indicated that the product got a conditional pass. As soon as we get the digital copies of the updated packaging or user manual, we'll write an addendum letter that we'll send you. And that addendum letter will tell um, 
the changes that you made and show photos of the updated packaging. And so that addendum letter will indicate your product now meets the wedding global quality standards. Mm -hmm. And then the product can be posted on the website and you'll have full support from Lighting Global. Then the follow-up for that is within three months, we require that you send us a photo of the hard copy of the packaging so that now you've had time to um, print and produce actual packaging with the corrected information on it. And so we require a close-up photo of the hard copy of the packaging showing that whatever language needed to be added or changed. And then a, a more distant photo of the packaging of a hundred, a hundred of the packages. And the reason that we're requiring that is because we want to know that you actually went from, you know, the idea of the digital, uh, the digital packaging or user manual that you implemented that and actually printed the corrected packaging. And so we'll look at the photo of the corrected packaging, make sure that it meets the lighting global quality standards. So we'll see that you printed a whole bunch and that you're really using those packages now. And at that point, your product is, uh, it continues to be on the, on the website and have Lighting Global support. If um, after three months, you don't send us the photos of the hard copies of the packaging, the product will lose support. So we give time for you to implement and print the corrections. Um, and we're just, we're just checking after a few months to make sure that it really got implemented. And just to reiterate, you can avoid all of this trouble by getting it right the first time. So we encourage people to submit their um, package designs and other uh, materials very early in the process, uh, even before the product gets sampled for testing, if at all possible. And then we just got a question from Drew. He asked um, that if we check the website for accuracy of consumer facing information, and if we also check other marketing and sales collateral, such as social media, poster flyers, and others. Um, so yes, we do check the website for accuracy um, to make sure that everything is matching up with the test results, and we check any other public facing information. Um, in terms of posters and flyers, we've actually had companies reach out to us before um, that we're interested in sharing that they are Lighting Global Quality Verified for some of their products in conferences, and they shared those posters with us, and we helped them make sure that they were aligned with our policies. So, um, yes, we do check the website and other materials um, publicly available for accuracy, and you can feel free to reach out to us at any time if you're unsure if they um, match our policies, and we'll help you review them. Okay, it seems that we got another hand raised. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, I have one more question. Like, uh, if we had like test the five volt USB port, and if you give it an overload, and then we turn off the whole system, and you need to turn on the whole system again to uh, to make everything get back to as it usual. Is that okay for the over uh, voltage protection? Hi, this is Kim again. So you're asking for volt for overload protection if uh, when the port's overloaded, it shuts the system off, but that can be corrected by turning the system off and then turning it back on and everything works correctly? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is that, is it, yeah, yes, that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And then do we have any other questions? I think we got one more, Riley. Um, we got a question from Roxanne Tooley. She said, you mentioned that submitting packaging as early as possible. If we are relying on the testing of production units to confirm specs for packaging, how do we handle this? Um, OK, 
Kim, do you want to answer this question? Sure. Yeah, um, understood. It's hard to, the, for the truth in advertising, it would be hard to know for sure the right, correct numbers if you haven't had your product uh, tested before. Some companies do some internal testing so that they have a pretty good idea. Some companies maybe uh, use a conservative number on the packaging. But again, if you put if you put what you think the products, how you think the product's going to perform and it performs 15% less than that in testing, you can always correct it. Um, you know, your product will still meet the standards, but you will have to go through the conditional test process. So we recommend, um, if you can, do an internal test so that you have some idea. And it's possible, too, that you could limit the ratings that you do put on the packaging. Um, I, mean, I won't want to recommend that, but if you're not confident and you, and you really don't want to have a conditional pass, you might limit what you put on there to only the solar runtime on the brightest setting and the uh, light output on the brightest setting. But again, um, I suppose experience with the product and, of course, if you've gone through testing before, that would help out. But that is um, unavoidable that you don't always know exactly how it's going to perform during testing. And just to be clear, in case anyone missed this the first time, if you if your product does receive a conditional pass, then you can um, you can immediately uh, start to you it, it it gets listed on the website, and you can um, uh, make use of that quality verified status, um, and provided that you do you take the necessary follow up steps after that. Um, but it's it, it's not a barrier to um, starting to market your product as as verified. And then we just got another question from Marianne. How long does the initial product testing and verification take? So we estimate anywhere between three to four months for product testing and verification. But it really depends on the complexity of the product and the test lab that you're testing that. But that's the um, estimated amount of time that we, that we say it takes. And then any other final questions? We also have some closing comments after the, after the Q&A, so don't hang up. <laughs> um, and like we mentioned before, we're always happy to answer any questions that you have um, about anything, including the consumer-facing information. Um, so always feel free to reach out to us and we'll provide our email contact at the end of this presentation. Okay, maybe we should move to the next section. Okay, uh, so lastly, we wanted to provide a few uh, ways that you can keep in touch with us. Um, so following this webinar, we recommend that you review the compliance guide uh, while all this information is fresh in your uh, memory. I've included a, a link to directly to uh, the document. However, you can, again, like I said, go to Lighting Global, the Lighting Global website, select the resources tab and sort by resource type. Um, second, after you've reviewed the document, uh, you feel free to submit any feedback or questions uh, to us. Our email is qa at lightingglobal.org. Um, that can be anything regarding uh, the contents um, as well as feedback on on elements of the document that are, are confusing. Um, we're constantly um, looking for new ways to, to make sure that our resources are um, clear and easy to understand, uh, so that is always appreciated. Um, finally, uh, or step number three would be to submit your consumer-facing materials for review. Um, and this can be done, uh, like I said, um, we're happy to 
uh, review documents prior to um, uh, submitting uh, the product for testing. Um, so like Riley mentioned, you can email her at uh, qa at lightingglobal.org um, with any questions you have uh, prior to um, submitting the product for testing. Um, and then finally, uh, you can stay in touch with the Lighting Global QA team by subscribing to our newsletter. Um, so if you go to the Lighting Global website, at the bottom of the webpage, there should be a box where you can enter in your contact information um, and subscribe. Uh, you would need to then select that you are interested in receiving news and updates on quality assurance, uh, and that will automatically subscribe you to our listserv. And on that note, I wanted to uh, mention that the Lighting Global Quality Standards are currently being considered by the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC, for adoption. And we have some uh, changes uh, specifically to the uh, reporting requirements related to solar home system kits. There are some changes under consideration. Um, we are, in the next week or two, planning to issue a summary of these changes that are under consideration. And we're interested in getting feedback from you um, and people throughout the industry. So if you would, if you want to make, if you're not currently subscribed to our newsletter and you want to be notified uh, when that request for comment comes out, then make sure that you do sign up for the newsletter. So you'll get a notification. Anything else, Lauren? Um, that's all I have. Okay. Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we'll follow up with an email shortly with a link to the slide presentation and it'll contain also the, um, the email address at which you can contact us. And uh, we look forward to hearing all of you and uh, hearing from from you all and we appreciate your commitment to quality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.